Go with us to the book of Matthew. Matthew chapter 5, we find ourselves in Matthew chapter 5. And the Sermon on the Mount as the Lord is teaching his Christians, his people. There's a great company of people and he's teaching them about who they are and what they do. The book of Matthew chapter 5, I'm going to read the text verse. Um, and keep it open after we read it. Here's what it says in verse number 13. And ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has lost its savor, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. Now, it's a short verse, and we're not going to read a lengthy text. So, a text, would you read it out loud with me? Let's read together. Would you do that? Read with us. Verse number 13, let's go together, shall we? Ye are the salt of the earth, but if the salt have lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? It is henceforth good for nothing, but to be cast out and to be trodden under foot of men. This morning, I want you to know that we hold in our hands a copy of God's word, but here we find the Lord addressing our theme of our message this morning, winning the right to be heard. But the concept and the underlining thought this morning that you'll find in this message is that we're going side by side with the lost soul. And for the last four weeks, been, we've been focusing on that Brother York. Wasn't he a hoot Sunday? Amen. Wasn't he a hoot? I'm not saying he's crazy, but he's awful close to it. Amen. He wouldn't have to go far to get there. He's just, just his facial expressions make me laugh. I just enjoy him and love him. And he's a brother and our friend as well. But we've been talking about what it is to be like to be side by side with a lost soul. And our focus has been, and our focus will stay there for just a little longer this morning, about side by side with a lost soul, side by side. Now, if you'd wonder what Jesus would say to you and I that live and walk and breathe alongside lost people, if you'd wonder what he would say to you, he would say that you are the salt of the world. You are the salt of the earth. But if the salt has lost its savior, wherewith shall it be salted? He said, you are. But if you're not, if, you're, if you've lost your saltiness, if you've lost that, if you've lost the consciousness of being the salt, then wherewith shall the world be salted? What is the answer for the unsaved world? What is the hope for them? Where will they turn? Where will they go? Uh, he said, a Christian, my friend, that has lost his consciousness, that he's walking beside lost souls. The one that's lost that, the church that's lost that, the pastor that's lost it, is good for nothing but to be trodden under foot of men. He said, because you are the salt of the world. Now, if I look in this text, I'd first of all say that it talks about being authentic. In other words, my friend, living what you say you are. The word authentic, as I look it up, it means a confirming to what is represented or claimed to be. Um, consistent between your words and your actions. The values that you claim and the actual priorities that you set. You know, to be real on the outside as well as on the inside is what God said that we need to be. He said, if the salt, my friend, has lost its savor, my friend, if he's not on the inside, what he proclaims to be on the outside, my friend, then there's great dangers in our life. Because, my friend, then there's no way for the place God puts you for them ever to be salted, for, ever, for them ever to be saved. Because you are in salt in your place. Now, she has got a couple salt shakers at the house, and um, it might not be healthy for you, but in the Scripture, salt is very very good, right? So I'm not going to talk about medical things, but I sure like it, amen. Yeah, I just like it, you know. You don't taste it and then put the seasoning on. You, you, you look at it and then put the seasoning on, then taste it, right? Uh, I'm not doing real good with the medical. But anyhow, where I'm going with that is simply this, is God's got different size and kinds of salt shakers, and you're a salt shaker. And if you're going to learn the right, my friend, to witness to somebody, then you're going to have to be authentic. You're going to have to be the same on the outside as you are on the inside. And my friend, if you're not on the outside but the inside, you've got a problem. But if you're on the inside and you're on the outside, then you've got a problem with the people that you'll witness to. Some years ago, I heard of it and seen it, and they showed it. There was a, there was a man sitting in a parking spot underneath the shade of a giant tree. 
They said that that tree was 10 foot through and more than 100 years old, and it fell during a slight windstorm, and it crushed the car and took the man's life. And after it had fallen, they realized that the tree looked so good on the outside, but the inside was diseased and rotten. There was nothing. It was completely hollow on the inside. I'm saying that Jesus said that I have given you the responsibility to be the salt of the world. I'm going to place you in a salt shaker, and I'm going to send you to your place. I've got a place for you, and I'm going to send you there. But you've got to be real. He said if the salt has lost its savor, then where will the unsaved, how will they ever be able to hear? How, how will they ever know? You know, can I say that sometimes if we're not careful, my friend, we, what we say we believe even about grace and what we don't practice or give and we're angry with others, my friend, can I say that if we're not on the outside as we are on the inside, we've got a problem. It didn't take me long driving. We had three drivers in my vehicle, and I got two beeps before we got around the Cincinnati Loop. You know what I'm trying to say? So I got canceled out for driving, so the two guys were with me, they only got one beep all the journey. That's pretty good, Amen. But I got two right off. Can I say that, my friend, you and I need to be very sure that, my friend, that inside we have our Savior. You know, our, our lifestyle literally opens and closes the doors of the unsaved people. Titus chapter 2 said, And all things show thyself a pattern of good works, and doctrine, showing uncorruptness and gravity and sincerity. Unsaved people watch you and I that they might have an excuse not to believe. Your neighbors watch you, your family watches you, your husband watches you, your daughter watches you, your children watch you, and they're looking for excuse to put you off and put you away. Christians, my friend, must, my friend, uh, are to be good news before they share the good news. Can I say that I believe that our most effective, my friend, silent witness is the walk of our life. And my friend, because of that, my friend, then we have liberty and will open the hearts and lives of people my friend, because literally, my friend, we are the salt of the earth. And winning the right, deserving the right to witness to a neighbor, witness to a co-worker, to witness to an office person or in the school, my friend, it's something as a believer, we must know that God said, okay, now Jesus said, I want you to get this real plain and clear. He said, now, you are the salt of the earth. I've often wondered what Jesus would tell us. I think he would look us all in our eyes and say, I want you to know that I placed you in this world to be the salt. And you've got to have savor in you. You've got to keep it there. It's got to become a part with you. It's got to become, my friend, something you become, and you'll be affected then. Give me, let me give you about five thoughts, and they'll be very brief as we pass away. First of all, my friend, and being authentic, first of all, my friend, we must be consistent. Whatsoever you do, do it heartily unto the Lord. Ecclesiastics 9 and 10, whatsoever you do, whatsoever your hand findeth to do, do with all of your might. I'm talking about being consistent. Now let me, let me make a statement that is worth hearing and worth remembering. It'll be most meaningful to some more than others. But some of those folk that are closest to you and that you care about most in this world are unsaved and unlawed. But some of those people will not be one in a week or a month or a year or two or three or four or five or six or ten. I think I prayed for my brother-in-law for 17 years to be saved. 17 years. And the first call that he made after he got saved was our house. What I'm trying to tell you that my friend literally is, that, my friend, some souls will not be saved instantly, but it'll take a lifetime of consistency, my friend, if you win it. You say, but I wasn't saved when my kids were little, and now they're grown, and they're here, and they're there. I'm telling you that they still can be won. That'll happen, but they'll have to be won by your consistency. Jesus said, you are the salt of the world. And if the salt loses its consistency, if it loses, my friend, of who he is on the outside and the inside, and they do not match, my friend, that the salt, the Savior will be gone. The Savior will be gone. And my friend, the effectiveness, my friend, of what salt does. Salt's amazing, isn't it? You know where I park my vehicle in the wintertime? The snow and the salt has fallen off, and you, got, you can tell exactly where I park my vehicle outside because that salt has eaten into the concrete at my house, eaten holes into the concrete. It's powerful. And my friend, where you park your life, where you, where you park your soul, my friend, it, because of your kid consistency, my friend, it'll make a difference. Some of the closest souls of your life can only be won by you being consistent every Sunday, 
every Sunday. <laughs> it's snowing, it's sleeting, it's too warm, it's too cold, it's too hot. I got a temperature, I'm sick because of consistency, because of every Sunday being consistent without any question. You read and study the life of Daniel, you'll pick him up in chapter number one. And you find that Nebuchadnezzar is a king at that time. And you remember the story that Daniel decided to go the, the way that God wanted him to go. And as they examined him, Nebuchadnezzar examined him, they found that he was 10 times better than all of those that didn't go the way of Daniel. But 70 years later, Darius the king examines Daniel. You know what? He places him as the leader of his kingdom after 70 years. After 70 years, you know what? The reason he was, the reason he was salty was, my friend, because he was consistent. Can I say that you and I need to come to a place, my friend, we're very, very consistent. Some have driven others away instead of driving them too. They not become a stepping stone whereby people can be saved, but they become, my friend, a stumbling block where people will be lost because of their inconsistency. Can I say that becoming faithful and consistent is so very important? Consistent. Number two, can I say that if you're going to if you're going to win the right to witness to anybody that's around you, then you're going to have to be authentic. You have to be authentic, my friend, by being consistent and then by having character. Not what you do, but the way you do it. Let me, let me illustrate. I'll just mention a couple, two names politically, okay? One is Richard Nixon and the other is Bill Clinton. And you put those two men in high levels in our country and you put a man, another man's name by the name of Billy Graham beside them. And the difference, my friend, no matter what your political persuasion, it doesn't make a difference. What the difference is, my friend, is their character. What Bill Clinton did, my friend, what, what Richard Nixon did, my friend, is so much different than the character, my friend, of a Christian, my friend, that was authentic by the name of Billy Graham. And even those, my friend, that opposed him, loved him, and respected him, and he had power in his witness to them. I'm saying being consistent. Being consistent. Being consistent and then having character. The Bible said that they seeing our good works will praise our Father in heaven. If they'll see who we are and they'll see what we do, that they'll be able to praise the Lord in heaven. They'll be able to see it because of now, my friend, the character and the consistency we have. And then can I say that I think that we need to be bold. Paul, pr Paul's prayer and what he asked us to pray for, that he might be able to speak the word of God with all boldness. That, my friend, there's a time and a place, my friend, where we need to be able to speak with boldness and courage, be courageous. I got a pastor friend up in the Northeast. I went and spoke there last September, matter of fact, in a men's retreat. He said he got a call from the offices rather early. The secretary said, Pastor, you got a man here by the name of, of Bill Baker. And uh, he said, I don't know. I don't know who Bill Baker is. I don't know, but I'll be there in a moment. And so... He finished up his visit and made his way to church, and sure enough, he walked in. He didn't know the man at all. The man requested that he would spend some time with him and began to tell his story. And he said, I was in the Army 20 years ago in Walter Reed, and he said, one night I got, I got messed up. I was on save. I got an alcohol. Next thing you know, I was drunk. Next thing I know, the police were chasing me. Next thing I know, I find myself in jail. Many multiple police were involved in catching me. Said they, they, they caught me, they put me in jail. I was waiting the sentence and the trial of what was going to be happening. Said they posted the bond two and a half days later. And he said, uh, he said they put me on, on bail and I paid bail and I got out. And he said, I came back to our state, Ohio. He said, 20 years ago, he said, I ran. They, the only thing they did to me was uh, they took my license. There was no, nobody was hurt. There was no injuries at all. And so they just pulled my license. Said Massachusetts wanted to extradite him and take him back, but Ohio wouldn't release him and let him go. Is that very interesting? So he lived now 20 years of his life. But what happened to Bill Baker was this, that Bill Baker got saved. And now he sits back in that pastor's office and said, now, pastor, here's my request of you. He told him the story. He said, I've gotten saved. And in just a few minutes after I talk to you, I'm going to leave, and I'm going to turn myself in. He said, it have been 20 years he said, I've got a family, I've got children, I'm a Christian. He said, I'm serving the Lord, I'm involved in a church plant. He said, he said but I, I've got to write this wrong. I've got to put it in order. I've got to put it in order. And he said, my request of you is, Pastor, if I can leave my vehicle set here, and if they, if they detain me and they keep me, then my wife will come and get my car in a few days, and, 
and it won't be forever. And the pastor gave him his blessings and, and sent him away. And he went off. And uh, it took him almost three days to find the records of 20 years ago. As they looked at the records, and they seen that all that he did is DUIs. He had multiple DUIs. And, and they seen that he come back in to make things right. They literally, they literally, my friend, not violating the law, but because of the time that took place, they literally overpassed what they had uh, going to sentence him for and let him go. Very interesting. But what I'm trying to say to you is this, is that, my friend, a person that is saved, if he's going to have salt in his witness, if he's going to have Savior, my friend, that has power in his witness, and he'll have the right to witness to somebody else, and he needs to realize that it's important that we need to right our wrongs, that we need to put them things in order. God said, there's something, my friend, that others cannot see, but they will know. Now, that is, my friend, that you'll need to have saved. You know, one, one sad place, a man came to me and said, Pastor, I've been trying to win my wife to the Lord, and I can't win her to the Lord. Because she takes her finger and points it at me, and she said, you have become a Christian, and now you know the Lord and you're walking, but look at all of those years and all that you've done to me and to our family, and you've never made it right. You've never made a difference. Can I say that, my friend, it'll take a long time to outlive some of the things we did before we were saved, but, my friend, we can clean up, and we can clean up, we can make a difference. I'm saying that you and I, my friend, need to be people of courage, amen. We need to be people of courage, consistent, have character, and then, my friend, have compassion. Having compassion with others. You know, uh, compassion is... Uh, something that's not on the outside. You can do things on the outside without compassion. You can do right things, you can do good things, but my friend, to have compassion on the inside, that which, that's what makes the difference. Jesus said, you're the salt of the world, but if the salt has loses its saltiness, its savior, if it doesn't go all the way through, it doesn't go deep inside of him, if he doesn't have it, my friend, then, then he's, he's good for nothing, he should be trodden underneath the foot of men. And if you're going to win the right to be able to witness to somebody, then you're going to have to have, my friend, you have to have compassion. Compassion means the sorrow for the sufferings of another, the feelings that others feel you are feeling with them and for them. Compassion. An attorney by the name of Gary Ingridge tells about a court case, a true court case, by the way, that a man was on a boat dock, and he was walking, and a couple docks over, his friends were in a boat. <clears throat> He's walking, and there's a rope that's stretched across the dock. The man trips, cannot swim, falls into cold, icy water. He struggles, he panics, he tries to yell. He goes down, he comes back up, he goes down and comes back up. And soon he disappears, and he's gone. What was very interesting about this court case is that one dock over, there was a man sitting in a lounge chair that heard and seen visually all that was happening. And when the family heard that they allowed, that he allowed their family member to drown without making one effort of saving him, they took him to court and they sued him for not helping their loved one to be saved from drowning. They lost, they lost the battle. I read, they had no legal, he had no legal responsibility to help the man. Whatever to save the other man's life, he had every, they declared he had every legal right to mind his own business and to refuse to become involved in the drowning man's life. Now, to me, that is, man, that's moving to me. I don't know. I don't know. I was involved in a situation where I can remember it. It was September 15th, exactly. It was because it was the, it was the evening, it was the day of the, it was the morning, actually, of the organization of our church, your church, HBBC, September the 15th. And Dad had flew in from Florida. His luggage had got there, but he didn't get there and got called in some traffic, and he didn't make it, but his luggage did. So he was going to come on a later flight. Well, I couldn't stay. I had Shug and I had Stace. And she's the only one we had then, and she had a blanket. And we were driving back on Highway 50 as it rounds there, coming out of Milford, taking 50 all the way into Hillsboro. It was raining so hard, and 
I got behind somebody to use their guidance, you know, following right straight behind them, you know. And I had someone right behind me, and all of a sudden it, it was one of them rainstorms where you should just probably just stop, you know. But we kept going, and I was following this person in front of me. All of a sudden they darted and I darted, only could find that there was a Buick Regal that was going very slow, a two-door Regal, a fairly good-sized car, a Buick Regal. And I told Chuck, I said, man, that's the person behind me, can't miss him. And uh, I watched in the mirror, and that car behind me that was following me uh, hit that car and spun it around, and all of a sudden exploding in the flame. You know, you don't know what you do in stuff like, in situations like that. But I stopped as quick as I could and backed up as quick as I could, and the, far, the fire, if you've ever seen a car on fire like this one here, it was the gas exploded, and so it was coming out underneath. It came out underneath the car and it was engulfed all the windows and the doors. It was a two-door Regal. And I was looking for something to break through a window. It spun it out and it was up against the guardrail. And I was looking for, I found a hubcap from the wreck and I threw that a couple times and it just bounced off the side window, just bounced off. Threw it as hard as I could. And then all of a sudden the Mustang pulled up and stopped and I said, I've got to have something. And the man pumped his trunk, popped his trunk and he had a jack in there, a scissor jack. And I knew there was just just a short time for that, whoever was in there to survive. The windows had already blackened. And what I didn't know, you firemen would know this, I didn't know there's so much sound with fire. I didn't know there was so much sound. There was a lot of sound there. You could you just hear it roaring, that the gas tank had ruptured and it was completely engulfed. And I took that scissor jack, not, not really thinking, probably maybe like I should, but I threw it through the driver's side window. And there was a woman there, and she was a little lady, and she was on her back in the seat, and she was trying to push. She had a little tiny thin tennis. She was trying to push the window out, trying to break the window out to get out. And I told her she had to come through the flames. I couldn't get her. I took Stacy's blanket, wrapped around it, went in after, pulled her so hard, and I pulled her over. Her and I, both of us, went over the guardrail down off that hill there in Highway 50. The first thing that she said to me, the first thing she said to me, she said, I thought I was going to burn alive. Now think about this for a second. Here I'm organizing your church, this church, September 15th, long time ago. And she says to me, I thought I'd burn alive. She'd been injured some and so. I pulled a track out of my pocket, was stained with her own blood, and gave it to her. Don't know what happened to her. I was kind of emotionally, you know, waiting. By then the ambulances and things got there and things started happening. The man said to me, an older man, he said, Young man, and I was young back in 1975, right? Amen. He said to me this. He said, man, you did a good job. And I thought in myself, I didn't say it, but I thought in myself, where were you at when I needed some help to break this window? man? Where were you at? You know, some Christians, if we're not very careful, if we're not real careful, my friend, we'll be like the guy sitting on the dock. And you will say, I have no legal right. I have no legal responsibility to care about your soul. You can live your life, do your thing, and, but God said, now, I'm going to take you and I'm going to give you the right. I'm going to give you the ability to earn the right to witness to your kids, to bring your kids to Christ, to bring your wife to Christ, bring your husband to Christ, to bring your neighbors to Christ, and you'll do it by being authentic, being filled The story is told of some good Samaritan. You know the story very well. There's a man that's been beaten, he's been robbed, and he's laying on the road. And these people began to walk by, and they pay no attention to him. The Levite, so busy getting to the temple, passes by the man that he could help. The man, my friend, walked on by it to the house of God, my friend, but he was not at all concerned the fact that he was that salt that God had placed in that man's life. It was a good Samaritan that made the difference. You know, if we're not very careful, our vision gets disrupted. Phyllis down here sets, and we have to watch her and her husband because he's still wanting to kiss on her all the time. So, you know, uh, Brother Ed, raise your hand. Won't you do that? Won't you do that? He, see that? He's got to hold her hand. Now, think about that. Man, can you break loose of her for just a minute? Look at that. Got a hold of that woman's hand. Man, I love it, brother. I love it. But she has a real vision problem. 
And she's lost all the vision looking straight forward. Because so sometimes if you walk up to her and she doesn't see who you are, she'll look at you like a bird looking at a worm in the ground, you know, kind of sideways, look out of the side, because she can only see out of the side. Can I say that God wants us to not to only be able to see straight forward. He wants us to be able to see those that are next to you. Can you see your neighbor? Can you see your neighbor from where you sit? When you're drinking your tea or your coffee or your soda or your pop, you're sitting on your porch, or you're driving your driveway. Do you see your neighbor? Do you see their neighbor? Side by side with the lost. Do you see him? Or have you had something physically the matter so that you can only see different parts of vision? Do you see them? Do you see their lights when you get up in the night and walk through your house? Do you see their lights on? Have you ever found yourself concerned for them? Do you see them? Do you see them? Jesus said, men, you are the salt of the earth. And if the salt has loses its savor, wherewith, what, what, what can ever happen to the unsaved people? What can ever happen to them? What can happen to them without you? Now we're keeping our salt shakers at our house. That's where they live. That's where they belong. you got your salt shakers. I'm the salt shaker. You're the salt shaker. And we must be very careful that we catch and keep our visions right. Amen. And then, my friend, if we're going to be authentic, it's going to cost us something. It's going to cost us something. It'll cost us some sacrifice. It'll cost us some money. It'll cost us some time. It'll cost us some money. Our people have a real burden for souls. And this men's advance is really quite an interesting deal. And the way it works is, you know, we've got different programs in our church that we back one up with the other. In other words, our sportsman's night out, we give away trips. We gave away five free trips this year. Some people paid for them. $800 just doesn't grow on trees. We paid for them. You gave that. You, some of you sent people. You sent people with one desire, not that they catch the biggest fish in the world, but that they'd be saved. So our schedule is we get up in the morning at 7 o'clock, and about 9.30 we finally get down to the dock. I linger a little long behind, and most of the time I call back in and check in things, see how things are going here, and see what's happening. And so it was, and I got down to the dock, and all of a sudden I hear this motion. Greg's got a, a man, one of our men that, that's gone, gotten saved. Got saved on the dock after the devotion. There's no pressure up there. There's no pressure. We don't pressure anybody. Don't, we don't have to. We don't have to. We just got to be with this and run with this a while. And so I invite everybody to come. The guys are anxious. They want to get on the fish. They want to, they don't want it. So I called, and so the dock, we got 26 men on this dock, and it's unstable, and water's coming up through. It's just really a deal, you know. As I walked up, as I walked up to Mother Moore, He said to me the first thing, he said, now I need to get my wife saved. And then he's, his son walked up and he said, Dad, it's the greatest day in all my life. So the next morning, go up business just like everything, go on everything, and all of a sudden I come back and I look and where this man was saved, somebody has taken very deliberately on purpose and they put a red circle. I mean, not with a can of spray paint, it looked like someone had taken literally so very neat and very proper, and they made that ever so thin line around it of where that man was saved at. So I've been trying to figure out who put this circle on this dock because we talk about having a place, having a place you can circle where you've been saved. Now, I'm fixing to leave out in just a couple hours. It's Thursday night, and I meet the son. I meet Todd at, we're getting a lemonade together. And I said, Todd, can you tell me, do you know who put that circle down on that dock where your daddy got saved? He said, I did. The next words he said to me, he said, you know what, I want to get in that circle tonight. I want to get in that circle tonight. I want to be saved. So I'm preparing, and I take off and send the word back. It's Pastor Kelly, you know, that the next thing I hear, I get a phone call. And not only did, uh, not only did that son get saved, but one of those other men we've been praying for got in that circle and got saved. He made his circle. What I'm just trying to tell you that, my friend, it'll cost you something. I'm saying that every person, my friend, that takes part in the offering 
my friend, took place in sending a missionary and a missionary's son and encouragement and was used by God while he was there. And God used powerfully and worked through him because it, I'm telling you what, it'll cost something. It'll cost your sacrifice of time, your sacrifice of money. Can I say that it'll cost something? It becomes real. A pastor friend of mine was going to get some flowers for his wife. Uh, walked into the flower shop and said what he wanted, and as he was being ready to pay for his flowers, the little lady was there and said, you know, what are you going to be doing with those flowers? And he said, you know, I'm going to take them home to my wife. And Nothing special, no anniversary, just I wanted her to know that I appreciate and I loved her. The little lady began to cry, and she said, you know, my husband used to do that, but he's now gone. The pastor friend said he watched the little lady walk out the, the flower store with her flowers, and he said he, after he finished his payment with his flowers, he took those flowers, walked out, and she was going down the sidewalk, and he called out to her and said, hey, hey, ma'am, hey, ma'am, ma'am, uh, your husband was unable to do this, so I want to do this for you. I want to give you these flowers. He said now for 10 years he's met, every, <laughs> he's met every year with that woman. He's developed such a relationship and a friendship. Now can I say that if you're willing to give something, it'll enable you to share the gospel with someone else. I mean, if you're willing to be, if you're willing to do, can I say that, my friend, it will enable you to have a witness to someone else. When we sacrifice for the good of others, my friend, it almost always gives us a chance to share the Lord Jesus with him. You know, can I say that being salt is simply in definition is this. It's treating people just like God would treat people. Now, let that sink in for a minute. We are joining God in this work, my friend, by being the salt. God is already good, and we as well need to be good. And my friend, that will make the difference. Many a times it takes many Christ-like acts, my friend, to open the door, open the heart of some people that are unsaved. It'll take a lot of goodness, a lot of good neighbors, a lot of good Christians, a lot of godly people, my friend, to touch their lives and to, to be moved, my friend, and to care and to love and make a difference. Some souls, my friend, are team effort. Or team effort. Team effort. Team effort. You know... You think about even this last week and those four that were saved, four men that were saved. And you come to conclude, my friend, there was a lot of touches, my friend, good touches, godly touches. On Thursday, we share just the things we're thankful for, and we go around completely around the room. And not all of those men are saved, of course. One of the young men that our people sent, that you sent, I had nothing to do with it. Use that paid his way. He said this. It was very interesting because we were concerned about him and his response. And he said, and I'll allow him to share it with his own life and his own testimony in the right time and the right place. But he said, I thank you for not giving up at me because he uses these words. He said, you be always been chipping away at me. And he was grateful that we didn't give up on him. We're chipping away at him. Interesting, isn't it? Amen? Chipping away at him. I'm saying that many a times it's team efforts. Now, this morning, you're in a service where there's a lot of salt. There's a lot of salt. There's a lot of Christians. And it ought to be a powerful place when you come in from the very first greeting to the first handshake to the first class you said under the first song you sing. There ought to be a lot of salt. There ought to be a lot of salt. But no matter how much salt there is, it comes to a time when you have got to respond to the Lord. You've got to respond because of the witness of those around you. This morning, we have an invitation. And God has been better to you than any beings, any human beings have ever been to you. God has been good to you. God has been good to us. God has been great and caring for us. But my friend, what you've got to do is something with your own personal decision. The reason that son painted that circle, I'm not sure if it was painted or it was a marker. I'm not exactly sure. Not offensive anyway. No one would ever know what that circle was. It's because we talked about having a place you could circle where you've been saved. This morning, this morning I'm going to ask you if you've never made a place to make you a place. To make you a place when you've received the Lord Jesus as your Savior. To make it your place. And then as a Christian, you are the salt. Do you, are you salty? Are you 
10 foot thick and 100 years old, but on the inside, you're hollow. Nothing there. Nothing there. And the winds of life will easily tip you over because you've rotted away on the inside, not on the outside, but on the inside. And because you're so weak on the inside, my friend, the outside will crumble with it. I ask you, how salty are you this morning? How salty are you this morning? How are you with God this morning and your power of your witness? Do you have the right to talk to others about their soul? Have you earned the right? We say those words just come out of my mouth. No, they didn't come out of your mouth. They came out of your heart. Well, they just slip out once in a while. No, no. They're always there. They just come out. You've never cleaned up your heart. Well, I just looked at those things just now and again. No, no. No, they're, they're always here. You've just never got control of these. I ask you this morning, how salty are you? How on the outside, comparable to the inside, how salty are you? You say, Pastor, I would love to win, and you can name that person to Christ. I would love that son or that daughter or that wife or that husband or that neighbor to Christ. You'll never be able to win them until you're salty. You win the right to show them how to be saved. You win the right. A pastor doesn't stay in one place for 40 years unless he's got some things on the inside, not just the outside. It's not what you hear, it's what I think, that's the reason I'm here. It's not what you see, it's what you don't see, that's the reason I'm here. It's not when you see me sitting at a desk, it's when you when you don't see me when I'm walking with my feet. It's not when you see me in the daylight, it's when you don't see me in the dark when I'm with the Lord on my knees. That's the reason I'm here. Because salt, your inside is important. How salty are you? You say, I want, I want the right. I want someone to be able to come to me and say, show me what to do. I need to be saved. Show me. Show me, what to, show me how to be saved. It only happened because you have salt within you. And you have to clean up, and it'll cost you something. It's worth it to clean out your tongue, to clean out your eyes, clean out your hand, clean out your pocketbook, clean up your computer, empty out your refrigerator. It's worth it. Worth it. Because, my friend, you are the salt of the earth. If the salt has lost its savior, then Jesus said, how shall it be salted? How will the lost people ever see? How will they ever see? How will they see? It's no good but to be thrown out and be trodden underneath the feet of men. Salty, how salty are you? If you're not saved, then be saved. If you're not salty, then on the knees, my friend, of